After that and all, let's have a look at another game for the Evolution of Star series. This is game 17. Alexander Alakheim playing white against Efin Bonilvajob. So, Bogo. I'll just call him Bogo from now on. <laughs> okay, so it was like an early um, Groomfield, semi Groomfield, but without white playing knight c3 now. Knight c3, d5 is modern kind of Groomfield defense territory. And usually, you know, cd, knight d4, e4, knight takes c3 happens. And white's kind of got a, a fractured, uh, you know, pawn structure. Uh, but this next move is going to transpose into a kind of improved uh, Groomfields, or I think Neo, is it Neo Groomfields? Kind of not quite um, Groomfield, because although d5 is played, it's without this potential for structural damage. After c takes, knight takes, there's no knight on c3, um, which means e4, okay, is putting the knight on b6, which we do see in modern GN games as a sort of different variation of the Groomfield without the capture on c3. But white's enjoying here a seemingly nice center. Knight c3 now, and I like personally uh, the look of white's position, bishop g7, bishop e3. Look at the conventional pressure that black would have on c5. It would seem to be a bit less here, actually. Um, and usually, you know, c5 is played by black, but uh, here, you know, d takes c is definitely looking on the cards. So it, it doesn't look to be quite right for black to play c5. So instead, knight c6 is played, which leads black into a little bit of trouble, I think, straight away, actually, in the opening. Um, not as much trouble as it should have been. After d5, um, knight e5, this is provocative play by the knights. You know, first that knight's, you know, gone over here. And now this, this knight is being a bit provocative like this, uh, provoking d5. But now bishop d4 seems to indicate why it has quite a stable space advantage. Uh, you know, an aggressive looking pawn chain. No real structural issues. Uh, but this next move was just unnecessary, I believe. Um, f6. It does give, you know, a square for the knight to go like that to f7. But it hems in the bishop and it also weakens the diagonal. Not only that, d5 could become an important square. If black ever plays e6, d5 is going to be a, a pivotal square, I, I, I would say. But, um, if black had just in this position, I think better is just castling. And if, um, as as this variation I prepared earlier shows, if f4 just, you know, accepts the exchange of dark square bishops, then black should be okay here. It's a little bit provocative, but uh, this pawn uh, center can be kind of double-edged, can be weak. There's no uh, easily exploitable weaknesses, pardon me, in the black position here. So um, if we go back, I think Bogo made his position worse with f6. And now we have f4, knight f7, and white stands a little bit better. But it's interesting a light square strategy is used by Alexander now, beginning with move a4. So he's not moving any of his kingside pieces just yet. He's seizing an opportunity to drive this knight to a worse kind of square. And he's actually prompting a reaction from black in the center here, actually, while the knight's still on b6. Uh, rather than allow like a5, knight d7, in which in which case e6 and e5 is going to be harder because taking on something, the, the bishop will be hemmed in. So this immediate reaction in the center is prompted, I think, by the move a4. But it comes at a little bit of cost for the d5 square, which is now not going to be occupied by the d5 pawn, but instead can be used as a pivot square by white. So he does take on percent. Uh, which some might find strange. It's the advanced pawn, but he's, he's looking for a more exploitable weakness. And now, after bishop takes a5, 97, and now he's puncturing um, the light squares a bit with a6, weakening black's control of c6 a bit, prompting this pawn to move to b6. So there's slightly weakened light squares. And this square hasn't got a white pawn sitting on it, sitting on it, so it can be potentially an outpost square, but it requires some very concrete calculation to make use of that outpost square immediately. After bishop b5, there's an implication actually already that bishop c6 might be annoying to support knight d5 or bishop d5. 
Queen e7 is played and now Alexander um, plays Knight g e2. One aspect of, of Queen e7, well there, there were two aspects there. First the f5 might be on the cards once black castles, in which case the, the Queen sitting on the e-file might be useful. But there's another much riskier idea that black might be intending to castle queenside. Now in modern times this kind of idea of casting queenside for black in the Groomfield is unheard of. Uh, it's it's quite risky, but I suppose Black's reasoning is that um, this pawn, okay, it might be a goal hanging pawn for the Black King, but it means that the A file is never going to be peeled open. So is is the Black King going to be safe on the Queen side? That's the big question. Well, he kicks the Bishop away from D4, and believe it or not, Black does dare castle Queen side. It's not really necessary. Black could have castled King side. And aimed, you know, for playing f5 later, and that would be quite a reasonable um, idea and position. And if later e5 in response to that, then again g5 uh, to undermine uh, the pawn chain. And I think black would be potentially okay. But black casting uh, queen side seems a little risky. But how exactly to exploit this now? Modern engines will find a very, very accurate move here to exploit the d5 square, and I think most people wouldn't wouldn't uh, play this uh, move. What what Alexander did did have a, a logic to it. Queen a4, it increases the pressure on the light squares, and it means now rook d1 and knight d5 might be supported. But the incisive move apparently just for those with technical interest, is knight d5. And now obviously black doesn't want to play bishop d5, queen d5, the queen will be right in on the light squares. But imagine queen d6, and now this is the variation which would have discouraged Alexander, I guess, in analysis. Because if you try and support the knight with, say, knight c3, then f5 is a strong undermining move, which is to be avoided. But in this position, there's actually a, a clinical move uh, temporarily offering the knight queen a4 and if bishop d5 now then rook d1 and I think white would get a clear advantage because he's getting that very important light squared bishop from black here which means that the use of d5 is going to be amplified as this variation shows say queen c7 rook takes d5 and black is without the light squared bishop and this can cause you know big strategic and tactical issues. Uh, the d5 is just weakened. White will control d5 quite comfortably in this variation. And this would represent a significant advantage. And there's still prospects of using this goal hanging pawn around the black king. That's still a very useful pawn to have, as this variation shows, with a big, big, big advantage for white, a crushing advantage after e takes d. You know, with entry points of c6 being available, it's difficult for black to even defend this position. Um, actually, coming to think about it though, let's, let's carry this on with rook d6 with engine help. Say rook takes d6, just to say bishop g3, nasty stuff on the diagonal. So that would be really dangerous idea. The whole idea of d5 and the light squares uh, shows that I think this, this was risky by black, this casting queen side. Um, but to exploit it requires uh, quite clinical play here. But this this is a good move anyway, queen a4. But after f5, white center is being a, a bit undermined now. After e5, g5. So black's really putting pressure on that e5 and undermining the pawn chain. Alexander now does weaken d5 a bit by offering the exchange of light square bishops. But now comes a surprising peace sack. So Bugway is not prepared to play passively. Also, Bishop c4 does carry with it an immediate threat of Queen c6 and Queen b7 mate. So the next move by Bogo has to be carefully considered. He defends against the Queen c6 threat and at the same time blows up the center. He plays a startling peace sacrifice. Knight d takes e5. Now it's not complete nonsense because it requires um, accurate play from white now. 
the queen side you know is a bit blocked up there's not going to be any easy open files to the black king so um, this is what happened now bishop takes queen takes after fe knight takes so the situation here is two pawns for the knight uh, but you know white is under a bit of pressure after castles queen c4 black is even off offering the exchange of queens because after knight c4 there's numerous threats like rook d2 you know potentially knight b2s uh, to expose pressure on c3 in some variations so it's not all easy going there and Alexander chose here to keep the queens on to try and you know maintain some attacking prospects actually just let's just engine check this this queen exchange if it's a small advantage for white or, or is it totally disappearing after knight takes c4 it's a difficult position actually this this is like less than half a pawn advantage It's actually a difficult position for white to play here and it would justify to a certain extent black castling queenside because he's got that blasting rook down the d file so this b4 is a very interesting reply okay opening uh, lines potentially against the black king after queen takes b4 now queen c2 so hitting f5 immediately and also white's going to be able to use the b5 square variations and hit a7 if he secures a knight on b5 now f5 is blocked and, and this is an attacking move as well knight d3 threatening some variations now knight takes f2 the queen is kicked now and is kicked after queen c4 again with rook a4 so black is waiting for a breathing moment after knight b5 here is the breathing moment which wasn't actually exploited i think black blundered badly here when he could get a very satisfactory position um, bogo played king b8 allowing a very good tactic which alexander plays but instead of king b8 there's a potential to slightly weaken white's king here with knight takes f2 and this is a variation i was checking earlier and now if king b8 although white is a piece up the dynamic imbalances here are very interesting it's three pawns for the knight this is a fantastic bishop on diagonal there's good pressure down on the d and e files here this is not such an easy position for white to play as this this variation demonstrates say rook a3 c4 and now rook a4 to try and win the pawn otherwise uh you know rook d3 is going to be dangerous with queen e3 so there's a lot of dangerous threats here uh, so say rook that rook moves king f1 it shows why it's quite passive here this very in this variation very passive and black will be forcibly now after queen d3 starting to gain the material back with you know threats like rook c2 now it's very very dangerous for white to have the king here exposed like this to these kind of tactics so say rook a3 taking and that will be winning back the piece and black will be doing very well here uh, black would have the advantage um, if we evaluate this position in this variation this fictional variation black would actually have no actually equality here just about or just about better for white still because that goal hanging pawn is still very useful rook d7 okay it's about equal but that's so much better than the game continuation in the game petition the, uh, the white king wasn't so exposed king b8 was played and now a brilliant um, tactic for it well, a simple kind of tactic as well but simple and effective um, i wonder if you can spot it if i give you uh, 10 seconds starting from now okay knight ed4 which simply it interrupts the, the rook's protection of d3 if that knight can be removed that would be great you know white can look forward to moves like queen f3 as well on the diagonal uh so other big threats so black is in real trouble now after this move uh as these variations show say black had played uh well knight f2 is out of the question now knight takes e6 the queen's attacked so bishop takes d4 now bishop takes d4 so there's no knight f2s anymore and the problem is any cd is also answered now with queen c7 check and they're mating on a7 so say rook d4 
rook d4 and the rook's immune and the knight is just loose so say check and now here a crushing move forget king h1 an even more incisive move is king f1 and the knight is still precariously placed here on d3 so say knight b4 can take it here because of that queen c7 tactic if it's not really a, a nice position if knight f4 then rook e1 and white stands a lot better as well so that this move really puts white in the total driving seat now in this game at move 29 knight e d4 it's a really crushing move it solves all the issues Bogo tries queen e4 but now the, the queen is, is kickable there with knight c3 and again this loose knight is about to be um, uh, munched. It's munched here. Queen takes d3. So black's lost that chance to weaken uh, the white king to really use the dynamism of the DNA files. It's all gone. The dynamic opportunities just disappeared, and white has all the dynamism now. And it's still a, it's a total clear piece up. And not only that, this b file is a raging attack with b6 as a target. After queen e6, there's queen f3 threatening mates now in one. That's defended meekly with queen f7. But now black's king position is slaughtered now with bishop takes b6. Uh, so black resigns here, but you can imagine if a takes, I think the most incisive move is actually uh, not taking uh, that pawn immediately, although that looks crushing. Everything does look crushing in this final position if it had been taken. That's actually a mate in eight. I was wondering also queen c6 might even be stronger. But b6 will do. And if, if king here, then there's rook b7. And if king c8, it's, it's just slaughter time for the black king. a7 is also showing that that goal hanging pawn can also be a promoted pawn pretty soon with huge advantage because it's also supported by the queen. So it's a really crushing uh, finish. But it seems Bogo had a slight opportunity there missed uh, with knight takes f2. Um, when when playing king b8. Uh, so on um, knight takes f2, if we look just briefly also at king, sorry, knight takes a7 check wouldn't have been any good here, I believe. Just king b8. So if knight c6, queen takes, and takes here. Then king takes here and black is not even a piece um black's equal on material and better so really knight f2 would would lead to some counterplay and it was all snuffed out really after this move knight ed4 after this casual looking king v8 knight ed4 just interrupts uh black's protection of, of d the d3 knight so it's a real problem now because you know this queen's sitting very well for, for the c7 opportunity okay so let's have a look um in overview and summary actually again so just a kind of Grunfeld near Grunfeld with white enjoying a space advantage f6 was a little bit unnecessary weakening unduly I think light squares so the right strategy I think by Alexander weakening the light squares um, some imprecision here that actually uh, there was the opportunity to play knight d5 here to try and grab black's light squared bishop but this is a good move as well just just not as strong and now black did start um, playing quite energetically with this piece sack uh, and later missed you know a golden opportunity with this aggressive knight coming in it could have here weaken the king because that rook had moved off f1 so knight f2 would force the king to recapture but it wasn't used here unfortunately for Bogo he didn't play knight takes f2 okay so he lost his counterplay and it's just started to be a clear piece up with a raging attack against the poor king which is now uh, very precariously placed in this situation with these blasting rooks and this blasting bishop sack just knocks black out Okay, hope you enjoyed that. Comments or questions on YouTube. Thanks very much.